Radio Tokyo broadcasting to American servicemen in the Pacific. The superiority of the Japanese Imperial Air Force, reliable neutral sources report, is rapidly increasing over the combined air forces of the aggressor nations in the Pacific. The lady, could I interrupt the existing a Japanese war machine is producing more and more aircraft to meet the demands of the speed up in the Japanese pilot training program. With this further superiority in men and equipment, reliable neutral sources what believe neutral sources? that the position of scattered American holding forces in the Pacific has become very great. Lady, I got a different script. The resistance of American airmen fighting unjustly thousands of miles from their loved ones will not be too effective. Their efforts delay only temporarily Japan's program Listen, lady, for quiet. the East Asia. It was further... Quiet, if Iran. you please. That's better. And so is this. This is the right side of the picture. What the Japanese Empire is trying practically to make up for. A lot of planes and the pilots that went with them don't belong to the Japs anymore. They're not in Tokyo Rose's script, but they're in ours. We're going to tell you a whodunit story without the usual mystery. It's going to be simple, direct, and practical. Right from the start, we're going to identify two sinister characters. Two long-legged roughnecks who have shot up more planes on the ground in the Southwest Pacific than the total shot down by our ACAC, aerial gunners, and fighters. They are the A-20, a jungle-skimming 700-mile ranger. And the B-25, a mean, low-down butcher boy, as any Jap within 850 miles of its base can tell you. Old Snootful here in the A-20 demand a lot of respect. Their story is pretty much the same. But we'll stick to the 25 for a couple of reasons. First, it's more of a modification and maintenance headache. And second, it's a little more versatile in combat. Let's see what it takes to get one ready and keep it ready for its job, which so far has been principally at minimum altitude. Plenty of strafing means burnt out barrels and skin failures. Plenty of work for the armorer and sheet metal worker. Long range and dusty strips bring up other considerations. At present, the J is the usual replacement model. If this continues, the ground crew's work will be standardized. Here's a J being prepared for combat, and here's the engineering officer in charge of the job. Tag along with him and find out what's ahead of you. Depots make some alterations, like changing one flexible and two fixed nose guns to five fixed guns. If they don't, it's your job. Vibrations from those guns cause skin trouble. Before that happens, Replace sections that fail regularly with heavier material, 51 thousandths of an inch. The auxiliary nose wheel door is another spot that requires an ounce of prevention. Remove it, because if you've done much strafing in Europe, you know gun vibration can jar it loose and send it flying into a prop or wing. The depot will put on blast plates padded with rubber to protect the fuselage. These should be removed every hundred hours the underside and fuselage cleaned with solvent and heat-resistant waterproof paint applied to prevent skin failure and corrosion. You'll also want the P-40 type blast tubes. Continuous firing causes the shorter standard ones to break off. Your air strips will be coral or dirt, which means dust after a few rainless days. So whenever you make a disconnect in your oil, fuel, or hydraulic system, seal it off immediately. Hydraulic valves are especially sensitive to dust. Here's a cross-flow valve, part of a hydraulic actuating cylinder, that became defective for this reason. A main wheel would not retract, so one valve kept one plane from getting over the target. Even with dust filters, you'll change engines and engine oil frequently. Oil will need replacement every 15 to 100 hours. Above and behind the bomb bay is the secret of the B-25's increased range. A 215-gallon tank above and a 150-gallon tank behind. You may have to put them in yourself. Another modification here is a guard like this one to protect lines and cables from the wires and caps that whip back when para-demolition bombs are released. In the cockpit, a number of changes make the pilot's job easier, especially in low-altitude runs when his attention must be fixed ahead. To avoid his groping for switches beside his seat, the salvo, Bombay open, and Bombay master toggle switches have all been moved so they are within easy sight and reach. The same goes for the generator and inverter switches. Here in the front office, gun vibration and humidity also give you trouble with instruments. Check them frequently and carefully. 
Outside again, there's the hard stand to think about. When it's made of coral or gravel, props get nicked unless steel mats are used to hold the loose stuff down. There's another danger from coral. When used as wheel chocks, it cuts tires. Heat, dust, and moisture cause fabric control surfaces to harden and crack. You have to be careful of your rigging, too. Dual control surfaces must be synchronized exactly. The effects of gun vibration, heat, and dust can be licked if you avail yourself of several years' experience in these parts. What isn't down in black and white, in technical memorandums written up in the Pacific, is in the heads of old timers. If you know how to lick all these problems, swell. But if you don't, you'd better bone up on them and a number of other things that worried these men a year and a half ago. They are the staff of a typical B-25 group. A year and a half ago, they were headed for Europe. And like you, some of their specialized training went out the window when they were reassigned to the tropics. For instance, S-4 here had to learn from scratch all the engineering tricks you've just seen. He also discovered that he should have brought lots of folding chairs and plywood for building the half dozen group installations he's been responsible for so far. His problems in this respect are shared by the group executive and the adjutant. The latter must find men to supplement the work of engineering battalions, which are usually busy with their first priority, the airstrip. Moving and setting up camps forces him to detail clerical and technical specialists to grubbing out and building up new areas. And here's the fellow that must keep the man on the job, whether or not that job is a specialty or merely general duty. He and his assistants in the squadrons are always fighting tropical infections and colds. Skin infections, often caused by infrequent bathing, are common. Ingenuity in preventing and curing low-grade pyodermia and tropical ulcers is required. Deeply seated ulcers often come from innocent scratches and insect bites. Ears are also troublesome. Fungus thrives in the moisture they retain after washing or bathing. To combat a diet of processed foods in which calcium is the greatest deficiency, bring along powdered milk and ice cream machines. Not only the medical officer, but also the intelligence officer had to reorient himself. Jap aircraft and shipping had to be mastered not from charts only, but as seen by crews on actual missions. This camouflage Jap shipping was sunk because the sharp eyes of a flyer spotted it. But photographs don't answer all your questions. For instance, you'll have trouble getting obliques. The group S2 and his assistants in the squadrons can't plan minimum altitude missions properly without them. Most of your photos for briefing are verticals and too high. You often have to plan the group's approach and the routes of the various squadrons over the target without the full knowledge of terrain obstacles that only obliques supply. During moves, when one squadron goes ahead as the group's advance echelon, or when a squadron or two are attached to a wing or air task force, a separate portable photographic setup including lab and repair facilities, is desirable. It's also desirable when strikes stage through new bases farther to the front. At such times, cameras get out of adjustment during landings, and over the target you get bad pictures. A mobile camera repair unit, no matter how makeshift, can correct this at the staging point. The practice of detaching squadrons, of staging them through bases away from the group, requires foresight and makes specialization among intelligence officers of a group impossible. Each squadron S2 must be practically independent, have his own target files, and be ready to move out with his squadron on short notice. With tactics, it's also been trial and error. Mistakes and experiments have been made until now the record is one of continuing success. The combat laboratory is still open in the Far Eastern Air Forces, but not wide open. Certain practices are standard. For instance, on the occasional medium altitude raid, there's always one B-25 in each squadron of A-20s or B-25s that makes the engineering officer happy. It's the lead ship, used less frequently for strafing than the other ships, and therefore requiring less maintenance. It carries a navigator and bombardier, and the pilots and the strafers behind bomb on it. With A-20 outfits, it's rarely if ever used for strafing.
on barge sweeps, you break up into elements of two or three and fly low, weaving as you go to avoid automatic fire from the shore. One plane at a time is about all the target will accommodate. Even with bigger ships, one plane may be all you can employ economically. But with freighters or transports, several planes can attack abreast or from different angles. And if the ship's not in a well-fortified harbor, a rat race starts and keeps going until ships and shipping facilities are well flattened. As we've told you, most A-20 and B-25 missions in the Southwest Pacific have been low-altitude strafing bombing runs on airstrips and supply and troop concentrations. Ordinarily, you approach your target over land, about five miles to the side, depending on the best terrain for surprise. You are harder to see over land, and you want to break away over water. For if you're hit, your chances of rescue at sea are better than in the jungle. At the end of the group's approach, you go over by squadrons, each squadron abreast if the target is large enough, at not less than 30 second intervals. This is to protect you from other squadrons strafing and bombing. Each squadron takes a little different heading for security and thorough target coverage. Each squadron also details planes to keep ACAC under fire. That's good planning. But how does it work out? Well, here's a pack of B-25s hugging the water to avoid radar on its way to strike a Jap airdrome. If the weather's bad, you go under it. When you can't get under it, you turn back. You keep a tight formation near Jap concentrations and stay low. If any zero pilots are aces, they didn't get that way by trying to crawl the back of a 25 formation. Five sneak in over the land, each squadron abreast, and by effective surprise, their greatest enemy, ground fire, is caught with its barrels down. Over supply and airplane dispersal areas they go, keeping the Japs' heads down. Behind them, their parafrags for personnel and grounded aircraft are floating down. If it's parafrags, one squadron can give good coverage to an area 4,000 by 1,500 feet. The second squadron may have a different job. It may be buzz bombing, hitting at gun emplacements or heavy installations with ordinary demolition bombs. That means more accurate placing, but not such thorough coverage. Another squadron is now coming up. It starts its run with more strafing. And later, with more parafrags, it will give the strip and revetment areas their second going over. squadron is approaching its share of the target, ready with parademos to polish off personnel and supply areas. But 
no matter how the squadron split up the target, or which squadron you're in, you're always out over the water on your breakaway, ready to join up with the rest of the boys and get home. And you're taking with you a large part of the answer to who done it in the Southwest Pacific. The B-25, as well as the A-20, just five groups of them, have taken much of the mystery out of Tokyo Rose's soap opera on the Japanese Imperial Air Force. They have done so because a handful of ground crews learned to stretch range while piling on guns, and because air crews learned to squeeze the last drop of tactical advantage out of these modifications. Now the expansion of this whodunit story into the history of the fall of the Japanese Empire awaits the arrival of you boys from Europe. You're going to write a lot of the aerial chapters in that history. <laughs>